Good evening and welcome to the virtual Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Will Frankel and I'm one of your three Athenaeum fellows this year. In October 2015, Donald Trump had participated in two Republican presidential primary debates. And as talk of establishment Republicans plot against his candidacy heated up, he was threatening to boycott the next. That month, National Review ran its first cover story about Trump, which concluded, quote, Trump is unlikely to be the Republican nominee, but he has exposed and widened the fissures on the American right. If conservatives are to thrive, they must figure out how to respond creatively, sensibly, and honorably to the public impulses he has so carelessly exploited, end quote. The prediction that the Trump campaign would fail was, of course, incorrect. At the time, most of us were. But its prediction that Trump's ideological legacy would define the future of conservatism has manifested indisputably. To discuss how conservatives should navigate this future, that story's author joins us tonight. Richard Lowry is the editor of National Review, a position he has held since being selected by William F. Buckley Jr. to lead the magazine. Lowry is also an opinion columnist at Politico and a regular guest on Meet the Press and Left, Right, and Center. Lowry's books include Legacy, Paying the Price for the Clinton Years, Lincoln Unbound, and most recently, The Case for Nationalism, How It Made Us Powerful, United, and Free. Using the written Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, we will be accepting questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send a question, please state your affiliation with the college. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. And now, please join me in welcoming Richard Lowry to the Athenaeum. Thanks so much, Will. I re really appreciate it. Uh, pleasure being with you guys here tonight. I wish it could be in, in person. Hopefully, we'll be back to a version of normal sometime soon here. You know, Mark Twain said that the ideal audience is inquisitive, informed, and drunk. So I assume we're just two out of three uh, tonight. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the future of American politics post-Trump. Uh, that's probably a misnomer. Post-Trump presidency would be more accurate because obviously he's not going anywhere anytime soon. I'll have a special emphasis on the emphasis on the Republican Party because that's what I, I, I think about uh, most. And my big takeaway is going to be that if you're hoping for a return of so-called normalcy in American politics anytime soon, it's not going to happen. The news cycles will be and have been a little less intense without Trump on Twitter, without Trump in the White House. But um, because of the ongoing nature of the culture war, which drives so much of the poisonous contention in our politics, th things aren't going to get uh, unified or more quote unquote normal anytime soon. So let me begin with just a general point. We always talk about changes in political parties. We talk sometimes about political parties being doomed. We've heard a lot about uh, that talk lately about the Republican Party, which I think is completely absurd. And I think there, there are two big points to make about this. One, the Republican Party represents about half the country. It's on the cusp of majority in the House. If things had bounced the other way and some House races last fall, if redistricting had gone differently um, last couple of years, Republicans very easily could have won uh, the majority in the House of Representatives, even though no one gave them any chance of doing that prior to the election. They're tied 50-50 in the Senate. I, I think they had uh, blown Georgia, which were winnable races. They only had to win one of those to hold on the, the majority. They still have the majority today, but it's 50-50. It's and they're control, in control of governorships in 27 states. And in 22 of those states, they have control of both of the, the governorships and the legislatures. So th this isn't a party that's gonna blink out of existence anytime soon. Second, political parties, uh, their fortunes might ebb and flow and their iterations change over time, but they're really robust, deeply embedded civic institutions in this country. And the DNA of the parties, despite changes over time and changing coalitions, the DNA are still broadly the same and recognizable um, the, way, the way they have been throughout all of history. 
uh, in the United States. As my colleague Dan McLaughlin points out, the Republican Party, pretty much since its inception, has been a fusion between classical liberal liberalism, so it's been a classical liberal wing, and a more populist elemental uh, conservatism. Abraham Lincoln, key founder of the party, represented this fusion himself. <clears throat> Prior to the breakup of the Whigs, he had been a lifelong um, Whig. And the problem the Whigs always had is the Jacksonian Democrats accused them of being elitists and very often uh, the charge stuck. You know, we, we think of Lincoln, you know, guy uh, um, grew up in a log cabin, you know, a rail splitter, a real man of the people, but he, he had to deal with these charges that he was an elitist uh, when he was coming up in politics. He married Mary Todd, uh, which is a, a socially ambitious uh, union. He was in favor of banks, uh, which had a had bad reputation <clears throat> uh, among Jacksonians. So what the former Whigs who became Republicans like Lincoln figured out is the new party had to be more populist than the Whigs. And what, what they did is they made the elite that really mattered in America, the slave holding aristocracy in the South. So they say, look, we're not elitist. We're opposing this aristocracy that tramples on the rights of, of people that looks down on labor and looks down on the working class in the North. And it turned out that was a very powerful uh, appeal that the Whigs lacked. Uh, so the Republicans in that sense, uh, right at the beginning, uh, were, were more populist um, than, than the Whigs. And then Lincoln also, I would argue, was a profound nationalist in the most fundamental sense. His first inaugural address when the country is falling apart is suffused with nationalist arguments. Uh, he argued that un the union is perpetual just by the nature of the thing. He said, quote, the union of these states is perpetual. Perpetuity is implied if not expressed in the fundamental law of all national governments. He argued that the, the American nation was older than the Declaration of Independence. And famously, at the end of that address, he talked uh, about this, this deep um, cultural continuity uh, in the country, the, the, so, as, as he put it, the mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriotic grave. During the war, he initially favored the word union or some variant of it. But over time, he began to use more and more of the word nation. At Gettysburg, uh, a speech that was uh, uh, suffused with the language of birth and death and renewal, very organic in that sense, he only used, used the word nation. And at, at the end of the second inaugural address, he talked about binding up the nation's wounds. As my colleague Dan McLaughlin writes, quote, the Republican Party's ideals were universal, but its culture was Midwestern and Protestant. Early Republicans wanted an even-handed government, but one that reflected their values. Those values, American nationalism, Christian moralism, economic self-reliance, law and order, run throughout the party's history. Now, what's different about Donald Trump is he represents the ascendance of the populist wing after Ed had, had long been in a subordinate position in the party to the classical liberalism. But populism, even though it was always uh, easy to miss, was part of the appeal of influential Republicans like Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, John McCain, even the patrician George H.W. Bush in his successful presidential campaign in 1988. Reagan agitated famously against the return of the Panama Canal uh, to, Man to Panama saying, we built it, we paid for it, it's ours. Uh, critics of the George H.W. Uh, Bush campaign in 1980 objected to the emphasis on flag waving and cultural issues. His son, George W. Bush, was offensive always to Eastern elites and didn't care and was often seen proud of it. And John McCain even had a, a deep Jacksonian reflex based on the idea, you hit us, we hit you harder. Now, if it was easy to miss the populism, at least in retrospect, of these Republicans, Trump's populism has been completely unmistakable. And what happened with Trump is he really reoriented 
uh, the battle lines in the culture war, away from issues related to uh, religion and sexual morality, although those are still important, and onto the grounds of populism, nationalism, and political correctness. Trump's culture war was, is, not sure exactly what verb you want to use there, fundamentally the people versus the elite, national sovereignty versus cosmopolitanism, patriotism versus multiculturalism, and fearlessness versus PC pieties. A huge element of his appeal still to uh, Republicans is that besides the occasional dissenting academic and brave business owner or ordinary citizen, Trump is, uh, for better or worse, the foremost symbol of resistance to the overwhelming woke cultural tide that has swept the media, academia, corporate America, Hollywood, professional sports, the big foundations, and almost everything in between. Now in office, he represented a shotgun marriage between his gut level populism and more traditional GOP priorities from tax cuts and judges to religious liberty and abortion. This is why you got this marriage of convenience between Trump and Mitch McConnell that with some uh, rocky spots here and there endured throughout the four years. I remember there's a story early on, I believe in the New York Times about the tensions between Trump and McConnell and the story referred to uh, McConnell getting emotional in a, a phone call uh, with with Trump and a, a longtime McConnell aide told me now, Rich, you, you, you must know uh, that can't possibly be true because Mitch McConnell doesn't have emotions. Well, uh, he has some emotions as, as we learned after the January 6th riot and his subsequent uh, treatment of, uh, of, of Trump. So this marriage is definitively off now. Um, but I, I think it's, it's just important to, to realize, even though the, the presidency uh, ended in pretty disgraceful fashion, that Trump has changed, even if he does nothing else, says nothing else, never endorses a, a, a candidate again, just plays golf in Mar-a-Lago, he's changed the Republican Party, I believe, irrevocably. I don't think the Republican Party is ever going back to its pre-Trump business-oriented accommodationist attitude to uh, China. The China hawks are ascendant in the Republican Party and will remain so. I don't think the party is ever going back to its conventional, uh, also business-oriented approach on immigration. Uh, immigration restrictionism in some form or other is here to stay in the Republican Party and I believe will more or less become a litmus test issue for Republicans like being pro-life on abortion is. And I, I think we saw in 2020 that a more populist nationalist type Republican party has more potential uh, to cross racial lines than a traditional Mitt Romney uh, type Republicanism. Th this, this new populist party has some appeal to uh, working class Latinos, working class African-American, especially working class uh, men. And we, we saw this in the amazing gains, despite you know, how divisive he could be, um, despite you know, what, what he did in the border, maybe because of it, amazing gains that Trump made among Hispanics. And not just in Florida, where they really worked it, that was Trump's best state level effort in the country. That operation really didn't shut down after 2016, ran right through to 2020. Uh, had really effective Spanish lang language messaging and uh, really used the progressive uh, label and the threat of socialism very effectively among these exile communities, not just Cubans, um, Venezuelans and others to uh, create a fear of the left of the Democratic Party. And th those communities, they don't like the word progressive. They're scared of the word progressive because it's what socialists, the, the word that socialist dictators back in their, the countries they fled used to uh, describe themselves. That said, I think the Republican party unquestionably needs to get beyond Trump, uh, who remains a potent force, even though he's really a, a three-time loser now. Uh, he lost in the 2018 
midterms, not unexpected. Usually um, incumbent presidents get shellacked two years into their term, but th this loss was worse than it had to be because Trump made himself so uh, repellent to suburbanites and especially suburban Republicans. He lost, no matter what else, he's, no matter what he says about it, the 2020 uh, re-election campaign, which was a, a winnable race. Um, he, he closed this thing uh, at the end. And if he hadn't made himself so radioactive with his unnecessarily offensive personal conduct and with his seemingly cavalier handling of the COVID crisis, and I say seemingly because the way he talked about it uh, was very hard to defend. At the same time, his administration uh, did pretty good work on COVID. And the, the idea that the Biden administration came in and it was an empty shelf in terms of the vaccination effort is completely uh, ridiculous. Operation Warp Speed was an amazing success. The, um, we sort of stumbled on the, out of the gate on the initial vac vaccination effort, but it was clear always it was gonna get better. And by the time Biden was talking about 100 million vaccines in the first 100 days when he first came in, we were already averaging more than a million uh, shots a day. So that, that was an effort that was inherited, but it was easy to miss because of the way uh, Trump talked about COVID, his over-optimism, his unwillingness to, to wear a mask, his talk of it, um, the, the end of the virus always being right around the corner. And then finally, uh, he lost the Georgia Senate races, which I referred to early, earlier, completely unnecessary. Defeat Georgia has changed as a state. Um, so, so these races were always going to be close, but Trump went out of his way to divide the Republican Party in the most incendiary terms he could in the run up to this election. And this is just politics 101. There's a reason that political parties seek to be unified in, in advance of, of hard fought, hugely consequential elections. Now, Trump will blame Mitch McConnell, say that uh, McConnell didn't agree to cut $2,000 checks and the COVID relief bill, excuse me, in, in late January. But this is an issue that Trump really didn't raise or, or focus on very much prior to there being a deal on that COVID relief bill that didn't include the $2,000 checks. And that was negotiated by his own people on the Hill. Uh, so if Trump thought this was such a powerful issue for Democrats, he, was, he played into their hands by um, raising it uh, in, in the most awkward timing, not, not just for Republicans on the Hill, but for the, these Senate um, incumbents, two of them running down uh, in Georgia. So just in pure electoral terms, all the winning uh, that Trump promised us stopped circa November of 2016. Now you can't take his incredible victory in that race away from him. Um, intellectually, I, I always thought in 2016, once we got to the general, he had about a 40% chance of winning, um, but it was still to get around the fact that it would be, and indeed, one of the just black swans in American electoral history. This guy had run for office before, hadn't been uh, you know, a winning general, um, began to run uh, almost on a lark or maybe as a PR stunt, and was elected president of the United States. That was an extraordinary um, thing. But uh, since then, he, he hasn't won. He, in 2016, he won with 46.1% of the vote and had to really thread the needle in key battleground states, the so-called blue, blue wall states. And in 2020, you know, he upped his percentage of the vote, which is uh, notable, but it was still just 46.9. And it's just really hard to win national elections if you're winning under 47% of uh, the vote. And then he, of course, dragged his party into this extraordinary dead end uh, by alleging election fraud. There's fraud in any election. The Democrats were engaged in sharp practices prior to the election, kind of loosening up rules to make it easier for people to vote by mail. But nothing of the sort that President Trump uh, alleged uh, happened. He you know, had for a while Sidney Powell, this conspiracy theorist, as his lawyer. His Twitter tweet feed was full of ridiculous misinformation about the election. He, he lost lawsuit after uh, lawsuit, and then this effort culminated 
in the Capitol Hill riot, which ended up getting him impeached for a second time. So Trump, he, he has obviously a devoted base. Uh, he can turn out that base. He's bonded that base uh, to him uh, to an extraordinary uh, extent. But the problem is the other side of the equation, which is which is the suburbs. And some Trump people say, Trump himself will say, well, it makes no sense that I lost and you had all these Republican House candidates, as I alluded to earlier, winning. Well, the reason for that was that the Republican House candidates, they got the Trump voters, and then they got um, a pretty good increment of the suburban voters. Trump, on the other hand, got the Trump voters and a, a little bit less of the suburban voters. So that, that makes a difference between winning, as many of these House candidates did, and losing. Uh, the way uh, Trump did. And the party's going to have to figure out going forward how to be less offensive to those suburban voters. Now, in theory, it should, uh, it, it should be easy for the party uh, to square um, this, this circle, right? You kind of pick up some of the issues that Trump identified, use those to uh, appeal to the working class voters that Trump has brought in. Uh, to the party. At the same time, you, you avoid some of the personal conduct that's been so offensive to those suburban voters. But we'll see. It might be that a lot of those working class voters, those new voters, were drawn to Trump's personality over and above uh, the issues. So that remains to be seen. But for the moment, uh, given all that's transpired, Trump has an incredible uh, continued grip on his party when you consider the fact that he's not on Twitter anymore. Um, he's not doing many interviews. I guess he popped up last week on, on some shows to uh, mark the, the passing of Rush Limbaugh, this conservative icon. But you think, you know, instead of taking it easy in Mar-a-Lago Mar and, and playing a fair amount of golf, that he had this incredible uh, political sheen, machine creating this loyalty to him and, and working every angle. And that's not true uh, at all. So at, at this juncture, it kind of looks as though the post-Trump era in the Republican Party will happen Never, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. But um, politics moves quickly, and you, you look um, last fifty years or so. Richard Nixon wins this incredible landslide victory in nineteen seventy-two. Gets embroiled in Watergate, resigns in disgrace in nineteen seventy-four. The uh, party is in total disarray. Jimmy Carter wins in 1976. And then lo and behold, by 1980, it's Ronald Reagan, um, another and different kind of Republican winning a landslide. That's an, in the scheme of things, that's an incredibly quick uh, turnaround. Look at the, the Tea Party, which is so dominant in Republican pol politics during the, the Obama years. Tea Party didn't exist in 2008 when Barack Obama won an overwhelming victory. Then it sprang to life almost immediately, in large part in opposition to the uh, proposed o Obamacare. And then by 2016, it had basically disappeared and been subsumed into the, the Trump phenomenon. A another big change in a very limited period of time in the scheme of things. So they're, they're inevitably going to be coming down the pike here, overwhelming controversies in the Bi Biden administration, or some crisis that moves us beyond the politics of the Trump presidency and the immediate after, aftermath. New um, issues will emerge, new movements and players on the right will emerge. And believe me, there are plenty of ambitious, talented uh, Republican politicians who think they're better suited to uh, winning the Republican nomination in 2024 than Donald Trump is and better suited to being president uh, than Donald Trump. Uh, is. Now, the incentives at the moment are for these ambitious Republicans, if they're shrewd, to kind of keep their heads down and continue to slipstream uh, behind Donald Trump, but that's not going to be true forever. Now, let me turn to Joe Biden. I'm, I'm not a huge fan, uh, as you might guess, of Joe Biden, but you have to give him credit that uh, one key insight he had from the beginning when he started wanting, running for the Democratic nomination was he realized to, um, to, to a greater extent than many other people realize, especially in the media, that the Democratic Party was not defined uh, by woke Twitter and the Obama Biden Democrats, as he called them, still constituted the party's center of gravity. Even, you know, this looked like a, a bad bet for 
a while. You know, he, he lost the, the first three contests kind of embarrassingly and uh, looked like uh, he should be left for, for dead. And then he goes down to South Carolina and, and mobilizes the African-American uh, vote, which is relatively moderate uh, in, in terms of Democratic um, primary constitu constituencies. That said, Joe Biden is as purely a negative candidate as we seen, have seen in a very long time. He ran largely on who he isn't and what he wouldn't do. He won the Democratic nomination in large part on the basis of not being Bernie Sanders. And then he won the United States presidency in large part on the basis of not being Donald Trump. And despite the, the um, descriptions of him very often as a moderate, that's not really true. It's, it's never been true of Joe Biden. For decades, what Biden has done is stayed right in the middle of the mainstream of the Democratic Party. So that was a very, very different place in the 1970s than it is now. The entire party has moved to the left and Joe Biden moved to the left with it. So it shouldn't be surprising that he's governing as he promised on, on the substance. Further to the left than his own record, further to the left of Barack Obama, and further to the left of any Democrat, uh, Democratic president who made his career prior to the ascendancy of the cultural left. So you see Biden on economic matters. He's out of the box with the proposed $1.9 trillion dollar relief bill that includes a $15 national minimum wage that not too long ago was the pipe dream, the, the impossible dream of the party's socialist wing, and also includes a massive bailout of states and localities. Biden campaigned on a $4 trillion tax increase over four years that one sympathetic observer has said would be, quote, one of the largest wealth transfers in American history. And Biden layers on top of this, a cultural agenda that represents a new dimension of radicalism that would be alien and baffling to past Democrats who may have wanted to extend the New Deal but never sought to transcend the, the so-called gender binary. So Biden has famously talked about unity, especially in his inaugural address, but it's not gonna happen. Uh, his agenda is not conducive to it. The media landscape in 21st century America is not agreeable to uh, uh, fostering and de facto enforcing a consensus the way it was way back before you guys were around in the pre-cable, pre-internet era when there were just three, this might be unimaginable, but there were just three broadcast networks and these the three three newscasters who, who did the, the national news on these broadcast networks were called the voice of God um, be, because there, there was very little to contradict them and kind of what they said uh, went, at least for a lot of people, that's, that's no longer the case and we're never returning, thank goodness, to a system um, like that. And then there's just the ascendancy of these cultural issues that I've re referred to a couple of times. They've come to the fore uh, in our politics in recent years. And the divisions over these issues, they go deeper and they're less prone to compromise or negotiation uh, than other issues. The difference, for instance, between the 1619 Project, uh, the New York Times, and Trump's counter, which was the 1776 Commission, which Biden immediately canceled, the difference between that involves profound questions about the nature of our country and its history that can't be worked out at a meeting of the House Appropriations Committee. So th these divisions, uh, they, they go very deep. So the kind of contention that we've seen in recent years, it's gonna stay with us. And by the way, having poisonous contention in American politics is not the exception. It's arguably the norm. Um, a, a lot of people, they're conception of what the American norm should be 
is defined by a brief period after World War II when there was relative consensus in this country. But it wasn't true in the 1790s, wasn't true obviously in the run-up to the Civil War in the 1850s, wasn't even true in the, the post-World War II era once you get to the, uh, the late 60s and the 1970s when um, that, that post-World War II consensus had broken down and you had domestic terrorism. You had people carrying out bombings in uh, the, the United States of America. You had horrible uh, riots in, in the cities. Um, some cities, core of cities um, destroyed, burned down and, and still haven't recovered to this day. So we shouldn't be naive um, a, a, about the, the fact that contention is, has always been part of this country's history. But in conclusion, uh, we've always been able to, if nothing else, fall back on the axiom of Otto von Bismarck, who once said that God looks after drunks, fools, and the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Lowry, for that presentation. Now we're going to transition into audience Q&A. So the first question comes from a student who's asking, your book, The Case for Nationalism, How It Made Us Powerful, rests on the idea of healthy nationalism. What is healthy nationalism and when does it become unhealthy? Would you say that the rise of white nationalism and its manifestation at our nation's capital on January 6th was an example of unhealthy nationalism? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would go further. It was not all just unhealthy nationalism. It wasn't nationalism at all. Uh, th th those folks, they have a DNA that, that runs back to domestic extremists in this country, uh, like the, the KKK. Uh, some of them were waving American flags. A lot of them were waving Confederate flags, which is an anti-nationalist symbol. And they were uh, desecrating a... Um, a famous building in this country that stands for our democracy, that if you're a nationalist, you should have inherent respect for. And they were just disrupting a procedure, the counting of the electoral votes that goes back to the, the very founding of this country. It's an ancient practice, which is the sort of thing nationalists should have inherent respect for. And I just think white nationalists is a contradiction in terms. And what true nationalism is, it's based on national unity. It's based on the, the existence of a national community um, that transcends tribe, race, clan. Now, nationalism is a very powerful and natural force. And anything that's powerful and natural is abused. And nationalism has been abused uh, throughout history. But that's not the, the, the only, or, or I would argue even the key thing to know about um, nationalism. And the, 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 um, uh, prior to the, the real um, era of sovereign nation states that we have now, you'd have um, empires. And uh, empires weren't democratic for a reason, because they're, they, they weren't unified peoples. And because of that, they lacked the social trust that's necessary to democracy. So the decision always had to be made in these, these empires, where it was the, the Ottoman Empire, or the Habsburg Empire, who's going to govern everyone else? You know, what's going to be the imperial center? What's going to be the language imposed on everyone else, the history, the culture imposed on everyone else? And some of these empires were quite long lasting. The Habsburgs lasted for 600 years, which is a pretty good run, but they always depended on an element of force keeping all the, 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 the constituent nations together in the Imperium. And the Habsburgs were, were referred to as the prison house of nations. And what you saw is once that coercive, once that coercion gave way, even slightly, these nations wanted to go their own way and govern themselves. And so, so the rise of modern democracy is caught up in the rise of the modern um, nation state. And the nationalists in the 19th century were liberals. They uh, believed in self-government. They believed in equal citizenship. They believed in popular sovereignty. And this kind of liberal nationalism has been defining in American history. We wouldn't have broken off from the British if we didn't want to govern ourselves. The British, was, the British were an empire. We were part of that empire, a pretty good empire, you know, as far as empires go in world history. Uh, no empire is perfect, but it was a relatively liberal empire. We were able, uh, com compared to, to other people under colonial rule, to govern ourselves, 
to a large extent, but we still wanted to go our own way. We wrote the constitution because we wanted a national government worthy of the name. The kind of Hamiltonian nationalist economic agenda is a thread that runs throughout American history. Uh, Washington, Hamilton, through Henry Clay, through Abraham Lincoln, uh, again, and then a key thread, uh, and I'll stop here. I could, I could go on all night about this. Uh, sorry for the rambling answer. But a key thread of American foreign policy in the 20th century was the belief that it was in our interest and it was right for the United States to vindicate the sovereignty of other uh, democratic states, that they should have secure borders and that they should uh, govern themselves through democratic means. And we were largely successful in that. And I would argue that the, the world has been more peaceful for it. Our next question comes from a international student at Claremont McKenna, who asks you to explain what's happening with traditional conservative American media. I hear that Fox News isn't the main voice and that it's trying to separate from Donald Trump and other media are instead taking its place. What are the dynamics of what's happening? This student asks. Yeah, that's a great question. So th this goes to a point I was making in my remarks. The, the media landscape now is just a, it's a small d democratic landscape. It, it used to be the media landscape dominated by um, a few big national newspapers, although you know, every town had a newspaper, maybe two, maybe three, uh, and three big broadcast networks. And that's all been blown up. And that's, that's very good. I think if you want to get... Um, good, solid information about a topic. There are more means to do it more quickly than ever before. And that's great. Now, the downside is if you just want to marinate and total schlock uh, that uh, is based on misinformation that just tells you what you want to hear, there are more ways to do that too. And unfortunately, on the right, we've seen a lot of that uh, after the election where you had uh, websites and networks catering to the um, desire of Republicans to be confirmed in their suspicion that the election uh, was stolen. And that you, you saw the rise of uh, Newsmax, a, a counter to Fox News. It was just largely based on just refusing to say Joe Biden was president-elect and airing a lot of uh, inf misinformation and conspiracy uh, theories. So I'm, I'm a fan of Fox News. Um, Charles Krauthammer used to quote the, the longtime um, a head of, head of Fox News, Roger Ailes is saying, um, Charles used to say about, uh, um, quote Roger Ailes for saying, well, I've, I figured out a great market niche, which is half of the country, because almost all the rest of the media uh, was, on, was on the center left, and Fox owned the conservative space. Now, there are more competitors in mass media um, with Fox uh, than ever before. So there are downsides to that. Um, as I say, you can get more bad information than, than ever before and be misinformed. That's really what you want. But I think it's better than having very limited sources of information, which we used to have. And if you're a conscientious news consumer, which I urge everyone to be, you can read around and, and figure stuff out. And, and as, as I say, get, get better informed more quickly than ever before. This next question is from a student. How should conservatives make social conservatism more appealing to young people? Oh, that's a great question. I uh, probably shouldn't ask me. There, there's a time when I was young, but it, the, the time has passed. <clears throat> um, so I, I think that like, the best case for social conservatism, it, you know, it, it shouldn't be based on moralizing, which if you're moralizing, even if you're right, you're going to turn people off. You know, uh, Abraham Lincoln, who was a, a teetotaler, you know, didn't didn't drink, ma made this point in a, a famous speech. You don't condemn people for for drinking. Um, you, you sympathize with them and try to win them over to your to your point of view because it's better for them. And and this is, I think, the most important thing um, about social conservatism. For where I sit, is it is it works. Um, it, it's it's better for people to have well-organized lives, to be uh, active in their communities, uh, to be uh, active in their um, um, churches or synagogues uh, and mosques, to all things being equal. Uh, and I don't wanna con condemn anyone, but it's generally you're, you're happier being married um, and, and, uh, uh, and, and living a version of a traditional um, lifestyle. Now, again, just 
I'm saying don't moralize. A lot of people might listen to what I just said. Oh, he's moralizing. But I, I don't mean it that way. I think that the best foot forward for social conservatism is, is this is what, on the whole, you know, not for everyone, we're not condemning anyone who's, you know, uh, um, d- doesn't adhere to, to, to this, um, the, these traditional ways of life. But most people are going to be happier um, if, they, if they, they live in accord in accord with these these um, basic um, basic axioms, and one of the reasons we've had the so many of these so-called deaths of despair in this country is, is so many people are disconnected. They're disconnected from civic life. They're disconnected from their community. They're only um, they're disconnected or, or only have an attenuated connection to the workplace. Um, they're not married, and they're they're on their own, and that's hard. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's depressing. It wasn't the, the way we're meant to live. And it, it, uh, it, it drives people to, to, to drink, uh, to drug abuse, uh, to d- depression and anxiety. So just, I, I just think one of the key priorities of both the right and the left, we might have different solutions to this and different ways of looking, looking at it, is how can we uh, address that kind of uh, what is sometimes called a toxic individualism and have people more embedded in their communities again. Another question comes from a student. With the Biden administration's removal of the 1776 commission and the growing acceptance of the New York Times 1619 project in schools across America, what do you think the teaching of American history and the education system as a whole will look like going forward? Well, I fear it'll be less truthful. So there, there is throughout our history, um, there, there's been myth making about our own history. There has been a, a desire to sugarcoat or look past some deep national sins. And to the extent the 16, 1619 project is, has been based on the impulse just to, to bring those things out and make them make us confront them and, and deal with them, all in favor of it. That, that's, that's good. That's, that's truthful, truthful history is what we should be after. My problem with the 1619 project is it's not truthful history. And it, it goes way over on the other side of the spectrum and basically tells lies about America and its history. Now, the 1619 Project reluctantly, the New York Times kind of cleaned some of this up. But the idea, as the lead essay in that project said, that a, a key goal of the American Revolution was to protect slavery, complete nonsense. The, uh, the idea that, uh, as that lead essay also presented it, that we, we went from the revolution almost immediately to a hardening of the rules around slavery and around the racial caste system in the United States. Complete nonsense. It's just ahistorical. It's, it's not the case. There was, there was a great opening on, on these issues around the time of the revolution, in part because we were confronted by the contradiction between the practice of, of slavery and the ideals that were enunciated in the revolution. So you have the states in, in the North uh, moving after the revolution to abolish, maybe over time, obviously much too slowly, but to abolish slavery and a loosening of, of rules around race. And you saw the same thing in the South. Now over time, uh, as we, we get uh, in, into the, the 19th century, those rules tighten up again and the, the system in, in the South becomes worse than ever before. But the beauty was that you had the flower of an anti-slavery movement in the North that uh, you know, uh, plays into the, the founding of the Republican Party and uh, eventually squashes slavery in uh, a re- another revolution that's incompletely realized, not fully realized in, into the, in law until the 1960s. But anyway, if, if, if you're not telling that story, what are you doing? You're just, you're distorting. And it's kind of, it's a natural human tendency to lie about your enemies or to lie about your critics, but to lie about yourself, to lie about your own country. I just don't understand that. And I, I fear that to the extent this has an influence uh, on education uh, in this country, K through 12 and, and college courses, it's going to, um, it's, it's not going to advance uh, historic uh, historical knowledge among young people is going to do exactly the opposite. The next question is from a student. Where do we draw the line between nationalism and patriotism? In other words, what makes Lincoln a nationalist rather than a patriot? Yeah, that's a great question. Great question. 
So I think these terms are really, they're interchangeable um, and loose and formal usage. Now, the way most people think about them is, well, patriotism is the word for everything that's good about national loyalty and national feeling, and nationalism is the word for everything bad about it. But I don't think that's a, a sustainable um, definition. If you want to be really technical about it, uh, patriotism comes from the root um, Latin patre, same root as, as patriarchy. It's, it's really love of your own, which is a natural uh, human impulse itself. Nationalism is, if you drill down on, I think, a more specific concept, which is a, a distinct people uh, united by a distinct culture, very often um, a common language, should govern a discrete piece of territory. Uh, that's, that's nationalism. So um, I I issues based around the, um, the, for instance, the importance of borders uh, it, it are, are, are more nationalist than patriotic. So both the patriot and nationalist will respect our flag or should and uh, um, uh, honor it you know, as set out in the, the, the US flag code. But uh, you can be a patriot and you know, want open borders. You, you can't be a nationalist and want open borders. So that, that, that's how in a nutshell I'd, I'd uh, answer that question. Our next question, also from a student, is whether you think setting aside rhetoric, Trump actually governed as a populist in the slightest. I think he did. Um, now, I think putting aside rhetoric, as the questioner puts it, is gets to an important point. It was it was more rhetorical than it was substantive. You know, he he was constantly attacking. Uh, the the elites mixing it up with the the media had a very kind of a, a emotive gut level way of communicating and that was a huge element of his populist appeal but he did represent as I, as I said in my my talk you know a different kind of republicanism not radically uh, different you could squint and 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 at, at certain days at least and say okay this is just this is a Republican president who likes tariffs but you know Ronald Reagan slapped tariffs on Japanese goods and is uh, skeptical uh, of immigration and thinks we need to to shut shut the border and uh, d doesn't like Chinese competition very much um, and and I, I think th there are people on the more populist, side of the spectrum on the right th than I am, who will tell you part of the problem was conservative policies have been thought about for decades. You have think tank after think tank devoted to conservative policies. You have a very influential group, the Federalist Society, totally devoted to promoting originalism, you know, uh, educating, uh, doing training law students, bringing them up um, and uh, feeding them into the, the judicial system. There's nothing like that infrastructure when it came to, to populism. So Trump, when he shows up in Washington, there are no think tanks. They're, they're, the personnel really isn't there. Another function of think tanks is it's kind of a government in exile. So you, you get elected and then you just bring them all in. There, there was no one to bring in um, for, for Trump. So a lot of the off-the-shelf policy was very traditional, you know, things that Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell supported, you know, the big tax cut that Paul Ryan had wanted for uh, decades, to, not just tax cut, but a tax reform. Um, Trump ends up doing it, right? Because what else is he going to do? Um, and, and a lot of the, the unique things he wanted to do were, were they just they hadn't been thought through. Great example of this, and then I'll stop. Trump sounded different than other Republicans on health care most of the time. You know, he hated Obamacare and wanted to repeal, which is a common um, thing among Republicans. But he also all the time said, people need health insurance. We need to help them get health insurance. I want everyone covered, which most Republicans don't say. But he never came up with any plan to actually do this. And he talked about it for years. It hurt him in the general election because he supported this uh, lawsuit against Obamacare that sought to have the law thrown out by the Supreme Court. And he had no replacement. And the reason, reason why I had no replacement is that no one had really thought it through. Um, There's some think tanks that came up with kind of ideas that could have been picked up by Trump, but he didn't, because this involved difficult choices 
and kind of concentrated on the, the policy in a way he wasn't interested in. He just never, just never did it. Same thing with infrastructure. He talked a lot about infrastructure, kind of thing that made him a little different than other Republicans, but never had a serious proposal for the same reason. So the, the, the answer to the, the question is, uh, it, was, it was very much a, a mixed record and one that real populists should be, I, I think, um, disappointed in on the substantive front. This question from a student is a follow-up to one of your previous answers. They're asking, if Patre is the love of your own, why is white nationalism a contradiction? Because our own is Americans. Our own is not our race, our tribe, or our clan. And, and this is one of the contributions of nationalism. It gets us thinking at a higher level um, than, than race, clan, and tribe. So if I'm an American nationalist, that doesn't have anything to do with race. That has to do with America. And um, an example I often use, if you, to illustrate this point and, and what I think is the deep cultural unity in this country, despite everything, that's very important and that we need to foster and that we still have. So if you just imagine tonight, an African American uh, meets a, a, a white American on the steps of the Paris Opera House, right? They instantly have more in common with one another than anyone around them. They speak the same language, dress largely the same, but they like basically the same kind of food. They have this deep a reservoir of common cultural uh, references running through our history, to our pop culture, to our sports. You know, they, they all would know who won the Super Bowl, right? Whether they're the football fans or not, whether they love Tom Brady or hate Tom Brady. Um, and so what is that? that that's a common Americanness, And it, it, it runs through every single part of the country. It runs through everyone in the country, whether on the right or on uh, the left. And that's, that's, that's nationalism. Uh, what a white nationalist is, that's, that's tribalism. That's, that's different. That's a, a sub-loyalty that nationalism's um, meant to transcend. Our next question is who you see as the top contenders for the GOP presidential nomination in 2024 and who you would most trust to take the party in the right direction? Uh, great question. Well, as, as Will uh, thankfully pointed out at the beginning, I was totally wrong about the 2016 Republican primary. So don't trust me. Don't trust me in predicting four years out um, the next time around. I kind of think I could be naive. You know, Trump's going to talk about running, but I think it's going to be hard. You know, he is a man of inexhaustible energy, but he is getting up there in years. He, you know, he, he ran a kind of new and different campaign in 2016. In 2020, he basically ran the same kind of campaign he did in 2016, and it was four years later. It was kind of a little different, and it didn't work. And I just don't see him innovating in that sense. And so he tried to run exactly the same for for I think talk about it at the end of the because to him after all this to to run. Uh, for Republican nomination and lose. Now, who, who's going to be um, compelling? I, I can just say early chatter. And look, we're four years out. There, there's a lot of it around Ron DeSantis, uh, the Republican governor of Florida, who is a major Trump ally, but also very serious about governing. And I think has done a tremendous job in Florida, he's been slammed by the media for the last year over his handling of COVID when his handling of COVID has actually been quite good and was much better, we now know or should be obvious to everyone than Andrew Cuomo's in New York, even though Andrew Cuomo was made into a, a saint uh, for, for his COVID performance in, in the press. And DeSantis, you know, ha he has, like Trump, not at the same level, but he has the right enemies. He's combative uh, with, with the press governor of a, a big swing state, um, and, and, he's, and he's working hard. Uh, and and I, I believe he's, he's looking at this and thinking of this. Uh, I play the exactly right. Marco Rudolph, all very much. I would expect them all to run.
Ben Sass from Nebraska, major Trump critic, might well run thinking that there's an anti-Trump lane, which doesn't seem to exist right now. Or if it does exist, you know, it's the tiniest possible lane in Republican politics. But again, as I said, things change over time. Maybe that lane grows and he would certainly, at least at this juncture, it looks like he'd have it to himself. Nikki Haley, obviously very interested uh, in running, had a little, she's kind of tangled herself up over Trump uh, the last month or two here. Um, but I, I think, you know, if Trump doesn't run, it's gonna be a, a, a pretty big field. And um, how it plays out, who's gonna be the strongest, I, I really, it's, it's so speculative at this point. The next is a student question. Um, is it possible for the Republican Party to succeed without appealing to racism? If so, how? I don't appeal to racism. I think Trump was highly divisive in all sorts of ways. I don't think he's a racist. And it, it just it wouldn't make sense that why would he make gains among minority voters uh, after four years uh, in, in office? So um, racism is toxic uh, politically. More importantly, it's wrong. Um, it's, it's incumbent of all people of um, goodwill to reject it root and branch. That said, I, I think the accusation is thrown around obviously just much too loosely. We just had um, just today a uh, story the Democratic governor from West Virginia who opposed Biden's OMB director near a Tandon might oppose another nominee uh, or two being accused of racism um, just, just for uh, opposing um, nominees who happen not to be white that he has deep substantive differences uh, with. So um, I, I think it cheapens the, the charge for it to be thrown around as loosely as it is these days. We've got lots of questions, but unfortunately we're running out of time and we wanted to leave you an opportunity to make some closing remarks before we conclude. Is there anything you wanna share with the audience? Oh yeah, I, I would just say, I, I really appreciate you guys listening uh, tonight. Uh, we need people who are engaged in this country, whatever your politics, whether right or left, who are committed to becoming as informed as they can, to learning as much about this country and its history, and uh, really importantly, are committed to civil uh, disagreement. So it, it, it's just, it's endemic to a democracy, especially American democracy, that we disagree on really profound things that we have sincerely held beliefs in. But to, to find a way forward together, it's, it's really important that we respect one another, uh, that we respect the differences of, of one another and engage in a civil manner. So to, to the extent that this night represents that, I really appreciate it. I think it's really important and uh, I've really enjoyed being here. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. Special thanks to Rich Lowry and to all of those who sent in their questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual Athenaeum event, which will be Thursday, February 25th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Professor Timothy Baylor of Furman University will join us to present a series of vignettes from historical epidemics of the past four centuries. See you all then.